One second. I should say hi, I'm Eli White. Um, I am actually uh, part of Musketeers Me. We're the owners of uh, PHP Architect. Um, if you're not familiar, we produce a magazine. You can come pet them later. I actually have a couple issues that you can take home with you if you are interested. Um, and we also do training and put on another conference and a bunch of other stuff and are purveyors of orange elephants. But for today, we're talking about WordPress. So really, there's sort of a, a history with myself. I know a lot of people, WordPress has a sort of varied history within PHP. A lot of people in the PHP community really like to, that is really not orange on this, is it? It's kind of yellow. Anyway, a lot of people in the PHP community really want to often, unfortunately in my mind, look down upon WordPress. And unfortunately, it's for many reasons. One is they are, depending on your stat in the keynote they, uh, there, you had 18%. I've seen stats of it being more like 20, 25%. It's been going up. Yes, it's been going up. And the stats only look at like the top million websites. When you look at beyond the top million, tons of them are our blogs, because none of us are in the top million. Um, well, some of us might be. but So there's a ton of WordPress stuff out there. And in the end, we're all in this together. This is all PHP. We can all work together. We can all help each other out. And even if WordPress is not for you, it's cool to know about certain parts of it. It's cool to know what it can do and what it can't do. So in the beginning, I was with everyone else. I was like, yeah, WordPress, yeah, I am never, ever going to use that for anything. Well, except for my blog, of course. Everyone's blog was on WordPress. Ah, oh, well, there you go. Um, and, and I actually, at the time, even ran my WordPress-based blog on WordPress.com because it was one click. And look, I have a blog. And so I never saw anything else that you could actually really do with WordPress because if you're doing WordPress.com hosting, you can't do anything other than run your blog because you know, every plugin you want to install is please pay $5. And I understand that. It's a business. Um, and so I'd always just sort of looked at it as this, yeah, it's a great software for a blog. And I had looked into it once, like at WordPress 2 point something. And yeah, it was great software for a blog. Um, but WordPress 3 came out, and especially 3.5 and on since. And they've completely changed how it is. And really now, it can be. It doesn't have to be. But it can be a full application framework if you want to use it that way. What changed for me was, as I mentioned, I, I'm with a company. We're a small company. There's uh, five of us, or four of us. And then we have a couple employees. Uh, called Musketeers Me. We formed a consulting company after a startup we were all working on together and really loved. Abruptly ran out of money. Abruptly, as in the phone call said, hey, you're not getting a paycheck for the last two weeks. Yeah. Um, however, uh, after starting this company and having like four or five good months of running and the consulting was starting to come in, we kind of got a little crazy. Hello. Keynote has lost the connection. I will click here. We acquired PHP Architect, the brand. Um, and suddenly now we were not only doing consulting, but doing all this other stuff. Um, and it turned, and so I was the one who, because at the time it just happened to work out that a couple of my partners were on huge consulting contracts that were paying for the fact we were buying PHP Architect. And so they had to be focused on that. So I kind of became the point man on PHP Architect not only in running stuff and being conference chair and getting all that going, but I was now also the programmer for it because there was stuff that needed changed. Um, there were, you know, we, as at any time you acquire something, the people who were running it, they were going, yeah, it's working fine. You acquire it and you look at it and go, oh my. But it turned out PHP Architect was completely built on WordPress. At least the front end was. Um, and let me actually show you a little bit about what the infrastructure that I inherited and, and we have now continued because it works. Um, and I just need little tweaks here and there. So actually, all of the business logic is handled by a web services layer, by an API that we have. So it's a separate server running with its own database going. And that holds all the business logic. So your user accounts, who has a subscription, when does their subscription run out, how, you know, what books and training and conferences do they have access to? All of that is handled by this web services layer. Then we're able to put any number of different WordPress servers up. These can have their own databases. They can be on separate servers. They can be completely isolated. So if one gets hacked, only that one is affected. 
and they just talk to that same web services API layer to be able to get everything they need. So now we can code anything we need in WordPress from a display and UI and content management side while having the fact that WordPress is a pretty good content management system and we just need to, hey, we need to throw up a page about whatever. Um, but all the business logic is kept back in the API and we have some custom plugins that handle that communication very easily. Now, of course, anyone can come in on any sort of device, talk to any of our WordPress sites, and it all works fine. Of course, we have the benefit, since we do have this API layer, it means we can actually also have things skip WordPress to go direct. So for example, we have, it's not been released yet. If you want to see it at some point, grab me this evening. I have a prototype of it on my iPad. We have an iPad app we're getting ready to release that actually makes it easy to read your magazine subscription. As new, you know, as new issues get released, you'll be, you know, you get a push notification, click a link, download it, and just view it right then and there. Um, we also have an internal tool we use for customer support and handling all of the conferences and everything that's actually an Adobe Air app that runs on the desktop. I wouldn't have done that myself, but that's what was handed to me, and it works. And I've now picked up ActionScript to <laughs> modify it and add a few things to it. And I'm like, okay, it's not that bad. So. I'd still like to replace it with a web app at some point, but it works, and there's bigger fish to fry. So, so that's sort of the infrastructure we have now, what I inherited and then sort of got thrust into. And my initial response, given my history with WordPress, was, oh my golly, this is on WordPress. And then I started getting into it and going, this, this is actually kind of cool. Then I get a little farther into it and realized, and I need to refactor a bunch of it, because um, a lot of it had been written in about the WordPress 2.8 era. And so a lot of it still worked, because WordPress did a fairly good job of keeping backwards compatibility, but it wasn't written the way you should be writing WordPress things now. So anyway, that's just a little bit of the history there. So I want to go into now, again, I'm going to try to get through as much as I can here, um, some you know, coding in WordPress specifically as a framework. So the first thing I do want to point out is, just like how PHP, one of the things that has made PHP so great is we have great documentation online. WordPress does too. Uh, they call it the codex. It's codex.wordpress.org. It is really great. Um, and when you're thinking of it as a framework, you really want to look at the function reference. Um, there will be, uh, these slides are already online on eliw.com if you want to download them and all the links should be clickable, I think, or at least cut and pasteable. Uh, so if you go to that page, it's kind of like going to php.net's function reference. There's a million functions to do a million different things. I do not have time to go over a million of them at this point. But I do want to just show you a few examples that, like with any framework, WordPress has a lot of its own way of doing things. You certainly don't have to use these. So for example, for escaping output, there's this whole data validation section. And so, for example, there is an escape HTML function. You could certainly use HTML special cares or HTML entities, the built-in PHP ways to do it, but you get benefits of using escape HTML. For one thing, of course, like using any framework, if you're using the built-in way, it makes your stuff more standard. As another WordPress dev comes in, it's going to be in a standard way. But it also, you get benefits of if there's some bug that needs fixed, if there's some new type of attack that comes in that may get fixed inside of this WordPress function, and then it's handled for you. But also you get some benefits of the fact that you'll notice you only have to pass in text. And anyone who's ever coded in an environment where you were doing lots of raw HTML entities, um, where you're always having to pass in what type of quote escaping you want and the character set and all of that, WordPress takes care of that for you, because WordPress, inside of its config, it knows what character set you have told it to operate in. And it's making sure your database and all the internal code and everything is with that character set. Um, and because it has these different functions for different purposes, HTML, text area, attribute, JavaScript, URL, and an escape SQL, it knows what quote type escaping is needed for that particular use case. So again, you don't have to use these, but they make it easy, just like any framework providing them. Similarly, WordPress has its own database layer. You could just write raw PDO and connect to any database you want and go in the middle of a plugin. And I've seen many that do this, and I've refactored a few that did, because they were talking to the same database, but yeah. Um, 
Again, I'm not going to really go through all this. It's just to show you that, look, there's a whole bunch of functions. And a lot of these mirror PDO-ish. Um, it does not use PDO under the hood at the moment. However, that's getting ready to change because it actually uses the old MySQL library that's now deprecated. Um, and so they actually have both a MySQL I and a PDO version out there that you can install as a plugin that will take it over because everything is extensible. Even the database layer is extensible. You can write your own database driver by extending this class, WPDB, and redo, oh, here's how I actually want you to connect, here's how I want you to query, and have it connect to anything. There's actually plugins available for lots of different database systems. Um, it still kind of assumes you're doing MySQL, so the database you're connecting to better be MySQL compatible SQL, because <laughs> there it is going to do some very specific MySQL things, um, like some of the, uh, the replace statements if someone's doing some of the replaces and stuff that aren't necessarily ANSI standard syntax. So um, there is one drawback to this that most people kind of cringe at. It is a global variable that is defined for you. Uh, it's defined as, you know, Bucks WPDB as a global. But that's how they did it, and that's how it is at the moment, and it works. So, but the fact is it's there, and it actually does make it, again, very simple. And part of the thing is that some of these actually even take care of caching for you, because WordPress has built-in caching layers. They're there, but don't work by default, because you actually have to install a cache backend connector to say, oh, I'm actually using APC, please use it, or I'm using memcached, please use it. But once you put one of those in place, a lot of these things, so especially if you're using these git row, git column, or git variable, it actually takes care of caching for you and can actually do some interesting caching. So for example, if you make this call to um, git row and you give it a query that returns multiple rows, it does the whole query and caches the whole query, but only gives you the row offset you asked for. So you can make another call to git row later with the same, uh, the same query and ask for a different row, and it pulls from the cached copy. Um, same thing with the git column and even the git variable, where you say, here's the big query that's going to return a lot. I want this column, this row, give me just that data bit. But I want you to execute the whole query and cache it all, because I'm actually going to ask for lots of them over time. So they're there. So like I said, there's a bunch more. Um, those are just a couple examples of the things you may be used to doing in PHP and the uh, the WordPress way of doing it. I do recommend if you really get into working on WordPress, you know, go to that function reference page, just start scrolling through it, click on interesting looking ones, uh, just like you would with any other framework and going down through the documentation. So I want to go through writing your first plugin. Um, it, it's ridiculously easy, and I just want to show you that fact, because I sort of assumed, like, oh, I'm going to write a plugin for WordPress. I'm going to figure out how to do all these things and connect all this stuff in. So I'm going to do this sort of with you as we go. So the first thing is, in case you're not familiar with what a plugin for WordPress is, um, a plugin is simply a compilation of code that you're going to extend WordPress with. All right? It can really do anything. It is the primary way you're going to add functionality to WordPress. I say primary because you can't. There, there's a couple funky ways you can do it in some for code drop-in points uh, for certain things. Also, you can actually add all the code you want into a theme instead of into a plugin. I don't recommend it, but because things start to get weird when you're like, I want to change the theme, and suddenly all of your code disappears. Um, again, I have a couple URLs that, again, has some really good documentation on taking you through this process also and give you more information than I'm going to. So to start off, the basics are very, very simple, all right? So we're going to create a subfolder inside of your WP content slash plugins directory. And then inside of, and you're just going to call that whatever you want. So we're going to make one called phpa-widgets. And inside of there, you need to make a single file. You are required to have one file in your plugins. And you officially have two options for naming it. The modern, better accepted thing is to name the file the exact same name as the directory. So if you had phpawidgets.com, you will name, or phpwidgets, name your directory, you will name the file phpa-widgets.php. You can also, which is the older way and still supported, just name it plugin.php. But then you end up with tons of plugin.phps in your code base, and it gets kind of annoying when you search for, find file, plugin.php. 
Um, and what WordPress does is that WordPress bootstraps itself on each request. It goes through the plugins directory. It looks at any that are activated, because you can activate and deactivate them, and that's stored in database configuration. For any that's activated, it finds this PHP, it finds the same named one. If that doesn't exist, it looks for a plugin.php. And it runs any code in there to set up whatever that plugin is going to add to WordPress. All right. So I'm going to just real quick show you. So if you can see that there, so inside my WP content, Somewhere here we go. I have a PHP a widgets, and I made a file called phpawidgets.php, if you can actually read that from back there or not. The code, I'll make sure I can get bigger. I can't quite make that part bigger. And that's really it. Almost. There's one more thing you have to do to actually make it proper, which is you have to add this block of commenting. So within WordPress, whether it's a theme or a plugin, the way that you actually tell WordPress what this plugin is or what this theme is so that it can show up inside of the UI is you give it this standardized block of comment. And that's coming out really pale back there, but um, again, it's on my website if you need to see it. Um, in the case of a plugin, you're adding this to that plugin.php file. If it's a theme, you're adding it into the CSS file, actually. The style.css is the one file that must exist for a theme. And so we're going through saying, here's the plugin's name, the plugin's URI, a description, a version, the author, the author's URI, the license. There's some other ones you can have in there. You don't have to have all of those. I think the plugin name and the plugin URI are like the basics. Um, but once you do this, some magic sort of happens. So I'm going to go in here and go ahead and open this and scroll to the top of it. And that better in the back? All right. So here we go. So I've done this here. And that's exactly what I had on the slide there before. And so now if I save this and I go over to my WordPress install, I can go over to Plugins, Install Plugins, and ignore the fact I have to update things. And here you go, it's actually appeared. And it's actually, because um, I had this done before, it's already activated. So here's what it would look like normally in the beginning. Let me bump that up a font size or two. So it's now appeared inside of here. And I can now go and activate it. So it's plugin activated. I go down here. It's not activated plugin. And all of these things, this used for my course, my name, which is a link, visit the plugin site, which is a link. All of that is just coming from that block of comment at the top of that file. All right. We now have a plugin. It does nothing. But you have now made a plugin. They say you can go in, you can click to enable it. And really, that's it. You're done. You have now made a plugin. It's a plugin that does absolutely nothing. Um, but that's all you have to do. So there you go. You know how to make a plugin. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we need to talk about to move on a little bit further here um, is the hook system. The hook system is really how you add and do almost anything in WordPress. Um, everything, any custom code you're creating gets attached to some hook that will then call your code at the appropriate point in time in the big, long bootstrap process of WordPress figuring out how to handle any and all event. And I'm not going to go into that whole how everything gets handled because that's a couple hours long itself. Um, and scarily impressive, um, or just scary, one of the two. So you can go and read all about the hook system at the URL there. Um, the big thing here is that there are two categories of hooks. There are two types. You have filters and you have actions. All right, and so let's, let's go into each of those separately here. So filter hooks, their whole purpose in life is to allow you to change content on the fly. Almost any time throughout WordPress, that someone go, that somewhere you call for some contents, like give me the title of a post, or give me the body of a post, or give me the URL for something, or hand me the URL for the internal CSS file for this thing. Like every single time something that could be considered content happens, chances are WordPress has a hook to allow you to filter that. There are, th I have say, I thousands of different hooks. Uh, I think as of WordPress 3.6, there were 1,183 different hooks. 
Um, we're now at WordPress 3.8 point something. Um, and officially, there's an unlimited number because a lot of the hooks are actually variable hooks where the name of the hook allows you to put something else in it to decide when it triggers to have essentially a variable in it. So officially, there's an unlimited number of them. Um, so I want to just go through just a quick example to show you what this is like. So, and you really have to go and look at this, these, either of these two filter references to figure out what hooks there are, how to use them, when you would want to use them. Um, this first one's the official one uh, in the documentation. Like the PHP documentation, sometimes the code moves faster than the documentation. And so basically, anytime something new is added in WordPress, they'll always, whoever's writing it goes, oh, right, and I should have a hook here and a hook here and a hook here and a hook here. And hooks are put in, but they don't necessarily get documented instantly. Um, this guy's website, adambrown.info, he actually, anytime a new release of WordPress comes out, he has a set of scripts he runs where he runs through the code base and pulls out every single name of a hook that exists and builds this huge array of it. There's zero documentation for it, but you can find hooks that haven't been documented yet through this. Um, so here's one example I want to go through, and this is just literally as simple as it can be. So there is a filter called the title, which obviously gets called anytime the title of a post is requested. You're going to read it from the database. Before you get that title, you're going to be allowed to do something to it. With all of these hooks, you always end up giving it a callback. All right, so you're going to make a function to do the work. Now, you can pass in, like with all callbacks, basically, you can pass in just the name of the function, and it works like I'm doing here. You could also throw a Lambda or anonymous function in there, and that would work fine as well. And there are two other parameters that are semi-optional at the end there. I have comma 10, comma 2. The comma 10 is a priority. 10 is the default, so you don't have to specify if you want it. Given that there could be hundreds or millions of hooks happening on the title, WordPress needs to know what order should I run them in, since that could change the potential output. So if you want the lower numbers run first and the higher numbers run last, I believe, unless I'm wrong on that. So, OK. <laughs> um, so if you want to make sure you're doing something that you want to happen the very first thing before any other filters touch it, set it to 1 or even 0, I think. Yeah. And if you want to make sure that this is the last filter that ever runs, set that to 9999 or max int or whatever you wish. Um, so the comma 2 is annoying because you have to look up in the docs every time. The comma 2 is how many parameters does the title take? Um, and the way WordPress is coded, you have to tell it when you set the hook. I happen to know this particular hook takes two parameters. And the only way to know that is to read the docs for each given filter. When you look up each given filter, it'll say, here's how many parameters I take. So in the case of the title, you're past two. You're actually past the title so that you have the raw text and can filter it. And you're past the ID of the post. So in case you want to do any extra logic of, I'm go oh, now that I have the ID, I'm going to look up this post, see what type of post it was based upon the type of post. I might do something different to the title, and you can add more logic. And with any filter, you simply return the filtered content, and that now replaces that content through the filter chain until it comes out the end. So in this case, to force the title case, all we have to do is return UC words of title, and UC words is a built-in PHP function, if you're not familiar with it, that simply capitalizes the first letter of every word, and therefore kind of gives you title case if you're familiar with title case from, I produce magazines, I know title case very well, it doesn't really, because it'll capitalize a uh, and in and words that shouldn't be, but it's, it's simple. All right. So let me show you this real quick. So I'm going to go over here, and just like in a cooking show, do the magic here. Oh, look, some code. I typed that very quickly. Um, so before I actually save that, let me hop back here real quick, and I'm going to go add a new post real quick. Maybe. I did say quick. This is all local. Hello, Chrome. There we go. It's probably punishing me because I haven't clicked this please update now thing. But I don't want to in the middle of class. So this is all lowercase. Hello, world. All right, so I'm going to take that. I'm going to scroll way down because I'm zoomed in. 
I'm going to publish it. Really? No, I can blame the Mac. I've had some problems with this ever since Mavericks, where .local hosts still sometimes want to try to contact the net. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to view that post. So I'm going to view that post, and you'll see this is all lowercase was the title, and it is in fact in all lowercase. So if I come over here now and save this, pop back over, reload the page. It's now uppercase. All right. So again, that's a ridiculously simple thing. But with adding what really amounted to one line of code and then the hooks to pull it in, all right, we were able to, able to now change that functionality across this entire WordPress install. Hopefully, you meant to do it everywhere. Because now, anytime someone requests the title of a post, any type of post, be that a post post or any of the other custom post types, which I am not going to get into in this talk because I don't have time. Because a post is not a post in WordPress. There's a type of post called post. I'll leave you with that part. Um, but now any content, think of post meaning just any content block that WordPress is storing. If it has a title, you ask for the title in any way, shape, or form, that title will now have those uppercase. So you've now written your first little bit there. You've written your first filter. So action hooks. Instead of filtering content being passed through them, action hooks are triggered upon some action happening in WordPress. So basically anything else, anything not counting content, right? Um, and this can go anywhere from the action hook of init. That means, OK, WordPress is now ready, and you want to jump in and say, but wait, and make it do something completely different, which is how you implement your own MVC inside of WordPress, which I have seen done and can be actually useful in some cases to go, if the URL structure started with slash whatever, don't do anything. I'm going to handle this myself, and I'm going to root it off to Symfony, or whatever you want to do. Um, and you can do that. Um, there are less of these. There's about 600 at the moment, give or take. But a lot of them are, again, variable ones, especially when you start looking into doing AJAX in WordPress. WordPress, for example, makes AJAX actually very easy to do. Um, and it does it by you setting up a couple action hooks with a name of what your, Word, your AJAX call is going to be. And then WordPress just goes, oh, look, I saw that AJAX call come in, and grabs it and runs your custom code to handle the endpoint, and you're done. Um, so I have an example here, which I'm not going to directly implement, but just to show an example of, so there's an action called save post that gets triggered every time you save a post. And so if you wanted to be an overbearing um, evil operator and know every time someone on your WordPress install added or edited a post, you could write something like this that would send you an email. So this code here for any post that comes in, it's going to, it does a couple little checks, but then you know, gets the title, gets the content, gets the permalink, turns it into a subject and message, and makes a call to WP Mail, which is WordPress's internal way to send an email. And it sends it to admin at example.com. So now anytime someone goes in and updates a post or adds a new post, you'll get an email saying, hello, this post was edited, and here's the content. Uh, that's just a very simple version. A lot of the action stuff gets very funky and very complicated. So we'll stick with that one for now. Because again, I only have an hour. So the next thing I want to get into is adding a short code. Because right? short codes are really a great way to add a bit of functionality um, without getting too crazy. So you can think of a shortcode basically as a macro. It's a macro that allows you to, inside of the content of any post on your site, to use your little shortcode. And your custom code now gets run in the middle of that content and echoes out whatever you wanted it to. All right. And that can be truly anything. It can be content, or it could echo out a JavaScript library, or just some raw JavaScript. Um, I've seen short codes that you know, do lots, and I've seen short codes that do little tiny bits. In fact, if you, uh, for example, uh, for the, our conference website for PHP Tech, uh, the entire uh, conference registration system, as well as the entire CFP system, if anyone here submitted to that CFP, that is all one short code in WordPress. So when you actually view the page inside of the WordPress admin, 
you simply see a short code in the content. You see a title in the short code. And that short code actually echoes out a bunch of HTML structure. A bun it includes a whole bunch of JavaScript into the page. And then there's now all this JavaScript set up and AJAX endpoints all created that allow that system to work. And we can drop that on multiple pages if we want on multiple URLs by just dropping that short code in and boom, there's a registration system. Boom, there's a registration system. So the formats for short codes basically think HTML tag, but brackets, all right? So in this case, we have one here, which is bracket gallery. Uh, there's some of these that are built into WordPress by default. Gallery is one of them. Gallery just simply takes any media that you have attached to a specific post. If you put bracket gallery in the middle of your post somewhere, all of those images suddenly become this little gallery view. So I realize I can't read this here, so you can't read it back there. But basically, this is a post that just has in the middle the gallery tag. And when it got output, suddenly where that gallery shortcode was, there's a whole bunch of headshots of me. Right? So very simple to use. They can get more complicated. So for example, you can actually add parameters into them. So there's another built-in shortcode called video. Uh, if you've ever had to embed like HTML5 video on a page, you know the pain of, okay, Firefox needs this format, Safari needs this format, IE needs this format. WordPress has a short code that handles that for you. You simply say video and then MP4 equals parameter, OGV equals parameter, MOV equals parameter, and it outputs all the appropriate HTML to make that happen. And it even has some other tags like loop equals on that makes the video automatically loop for you. So you can put in parameters like that. It's also possible to actually have shortcodes. Again, think HTML tag. You can wrap content with a shortcode. So another built-in one that is used in WordPress is caption. And this one's used all the time, even if you don't realize it. Because if you're in a post and you like add an image to that post, and this little editor pops up and lets you say, what should the alt text be? And do you want a caption? And should it be aligned left or right? What it actually injects into the page, if you view the source later, is it generates a short code on your behalf. The UI does. And so that short code is caption. And it'll have things in it, like a parameter for width, or the actual caption text, in this case, Rasmus Lerdorf. And then it wraps the image tag with that caption. And then you have a close short tag block, which again, just looks like a close HTML block, but with square brackets. So there's a lot of flexibility of what a short code can do. So let's go through actually looking at creating one of these. So here would be a very simple, straightforward shortcode. So let's say you wanted to make, have the ability to somewhere on a page just say bracket contact, and it would output for you an email link that is prepared to be non-spam har spam harvestable uh, by spam bots. There's actually a function built into WordPress called anti-spam bot that can take care of that for you, but you can't directly call the function in the middle of a page, so that's what a shortcode's for. So the way you do this is, again, you're going to call add shortcode. You're going to specify the name that you want for the shortcode, and then you're going to give it a callback. In this case, we're giving it a function name of contact us. That function, it has a parameter called attributes we're going to ignore at the moment. Then we're simply going to call anti-spambot on mail2contact at phparch.com and then return that link. Now, anywhere we want on the page after having done this, we can type contact and a contact us link appears and it's not spam harvestable. And if spam bots figure out how to handle how anti-spam bots doing it, WordPress will update and come up with a new way to make sure it's not spam harvestable. But we can add a few things into that. So let's talk about that attributes uh, parameter. Um, any parameters that you want to come in are passed into that attributes parameter. But you need to do a few things to it first to use it properly. You should not use it raw for various reasons. And you can read up on that on WordPress. So let's say here's the usage we want. We want to be able to say contact. Email equals and give it an email address. And text equals and give it some text you want to say. And you want that to turn into now a link where the text is press department. But if you click it, it's a mail to press at phparch.com. 
So what you do, we're going to create our contact us. We have attributes. The magic thing you need to do is pass it, pass the attributes through a function called shortcode ats. The parameter you give to shortcode ats is an array of what are the parameters you are expecting and a default value you'd like to accept, or you'd like if that parameter is not provided. All right. So in this case, we're going to say we are expecting email and we are expecting text. We want their defaults to be contact at and contact us. And then you pass in the attributes. And then our code's the same. We're calling anti-spam bot, and we're returning the URL to it. OK? So it's really straightforward. The other thing, I have this here because you will see this all the time in WordPress code. It's common practice. I know some people hate it, and some people love it. But there's a function in PHP called extract. Is anyone not familiar with extract? Yeah. Uh, what extract does is it takes an array. So shortcode ats returns an array of your attributes. Extract takes an array and turns them into local variables. So the array that had email equals and text equals becomes bucks email and bucks text. Um, and it's just a shortcut way, and you'll see all the time of extract shortcode ats, so that later on you can just say bucks email, bucks text. You certainly don't have to do that. You could just save the output of the shortcode ats into an array. But it's common practice. Actually, I want to see real quick what my next example was. <laughs> yes. It'll come up in a second. So like I said, you can also have your tags wrap content and read that content in of whatever was wrapped, as well as handling parameters. You do that by actually simply including another um, parameter to your callback. Um, I named mine content. You need to give it a default value of null, because if someone uses your tag without doing the wrap, it will still happily call your function and simply pass null in as the content. Um, so if you don't do that, then you'll cause WordPress to crash if someone does that. And you really don't want that to happen. So you want to give it the default null. And if you really needed it to be wrapped, handle that inside of your shortcode in some way by just going, oh, I didn't get a content. I'm just going to echo nothing. Or in some cases, I've seen shortcodes where they actually like echo out a little error message of, you know, slash, slash, <laughs> shortcode not used properly. Um, that depends on your point of view of whether you want something like that appearing on a production site. But, but really, after you've done that, you just get to use it directly. It, it's really that simple. So you have the content, and you have access to that. So now we've refactored this, so instead of using two parameters, it's acting more like an HTML tag. So we've now renamed it anti-spam. So in anti-spam, email equals, here's the email address, and we're wrapping it around the text we want linked. Yes? The right plus string there, does any of KP come with that, or is it on your own? The right for us, in this case, it's on your own, the way we're using it. You could call anti spam bot around that as well. Or escape HTML, yeah. My simple example doesn't have that at the moment. But the code as written here is very Yes, yes, it is. Because again, this is a simple example of a right outputting a single tag. But again, you can output whatever you want. Um, can you use nest uh, tags? Yeah. We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> kind of, and we'll get there. But I had a quick example to show of doing that. Because in the end, um, using the content is actually the simplest thing, because you don't have to deal with all the attributes and calling shortcode ats and all that. Um, so here is an extremely simple shortcode that simply rot 13 is whatever you wrap. Okay? Um, so we've created a short code called rot 13. All it does is call string rot 13 on content. All right? So if I head over back here to my thing, if I edit my post, and yeah, this is Mavericks being stupid. Because once you've done it once, you can then keep clicking and it's fine. But when it's DNS cache exits, 
it tries to do it again. So I can come in here and say rot 13, wrap this is messed up, rot 13. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Going to update that. There it goes. View post. And it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is I don't think I saved this. So let's try that again. There we go. So now that content that was wrapped got brought 13. So to that question, if I tried right now to just do that, about 13, if I tried to embed it like that, um, there are multiple reasons why that won't work. And I'll show you real quick then get into them. Either that or my local database is having issues because this is all local at the moment. So you'll notice that it, what actually happened was the, the short code parsing string is very simplistic. So it found that first rot 13, started rot 13 in everything inside of it until it found the first end rot 13, which was actually the one that should have closed this one. That closed it all, and then that was just random text afterwards. Um, now what you can do which I believe is my next slide. <laughs> you can make it possible to nest. All right. Um, all you have to do, as was said, is wherever your content is or wherever you want to allow nesting. You don't have to allow the nesting over your entire content. You could process the content and split it and only allow nesting in certain parts. You simply make a call to do short code, which recursively re-jump starts the short code engine and now looks at that content for short codes. And continues on down the line and it's elephants all the way down. Um, so now you could do something like this where if you had the anti-spam and then inside of it rot 13 some text and that would work. Now the part that still won't work is let me show you real quick. Let me just go in here and do this. So I'm going to say do short code on this content here. Theoretically, that, I just saved it, should make this now work because they are nested. Yes, exactly. It will not work because it's the same tag. What will now happen is that first one disappeared because it did understand the nesting. It started processing. It saw that first tag. But when the original one got to the end, it still picked the wrong end, right? Then it started running short code on the interior, which now started with a rot 13 but didn't end with one. So it saw that as a complete tag with simply no ending and processed it as an empty one with content null. So you can nest if you do that, but you can never nest the same tag within itself. Um, one trick I have seen where people really wanted to do that is if you really want to be crazy is you could do something like this. You simply now have two short codes that call the same function. And now you can nest rot 31 inside of 13 and a 13 inside of the 31. And I don't recommend it. Just saying it's possible. I have actually seen that giving multiple names done before just for typos. Like, you know, you made a short tag called, you know, PHPA dash contact us, and people kept forgetting the dash. So you make a version without the dash also as an alias, essentially. There's not that much overhead to that. How are we doing on time here? Oh, I am running low on time. All right, so let's get into widgets real quick. As I said, they are magical reusable elements, kind of like unicorns. Really, in a sense, a widget is to your design what a shortcode is to your content. So a short code is a way for you to inject some type of code into your content. But short codes are only usable in your content without doing funky do short code calls and hacking, hacking it into something else. 
a widget is a way for your des you to make a reusable visual element and reuse that on different parts of your theme, okay? Or on different websites by pulling it in in different spots. Um, they're used in dynamic sidebars. So in WordPress, you have this idea of dynamic sidebars, which is simply an area that widgets can be dropped into. And you make a widget, and you can now drop it in. So this is a basic widget, um, except you have to fill in the code, but you know. Um, so you end up simply extending WP underscore widget. It's all nicely class placed. It didn't used to be this way, but this is how it is now. And please don't do it the old way. Um, and there are four uh, functions, four methods you need to define, and we'll go into those in a second. And then to create it, you call add action. You are now using an action hook. The action hook you want to hook onto is widgets init, because when the widgets init action hook is called by WordPress, that's the time to initialize all your widgets. If you do it later than that, they may not always work. If you do it before that, they will never work. So, in fact, you'll probably get some errors. In this case, I have an anonymous function that's actually making the call register widget and giving it my class name. And that call to register widget takes care of finding the class by its class name and taking care of it. And that's just how the magic works. So let's take you into this real quick. So to instantiate the widget, you have to call the parent and pass in some parameters. So inside of your constructor, you end up making a call to parent construct. And you pass in three things. First of all, you pass in a base ID. This must be something unique to this widget across that entire WordPress install. So don't call it Bob. Don't call it Widget. Feel free to make it as ugly as you want. It doesn't matter ever again other than there's something unique here because it's used as a database key for looking up this widget later. All right. Um, you then pass in a title or name of the widget. And this is just what gets displayed inside of the UI. And then there is an array you can pass in for additional parameters. But right now, there's really only one, which is description, which is what also displays in the UI. They just actually got smart and decided, let's not just keep adding new parameters in the future. Let's just make an array so that we can add more as we wish without making things crazy. So now, to actually create the output, you create the widget function. The widget function has two things passed in, args and instance. Ignore instance at the moment. Um, what args is, args is an array that has a few things in it that you should use but do not have to use to make sure that your widget looks like a widget in your theme. Specifically, it has four things in it. It has before widget, after widget, before title, and after title. And so to make a properly looking widget, you should always echo out your before widget at the beginning and after widget at the end. And you should wrap whatever title you want in before title and after title and put your content in between. Now, the reason these are passed in instead of being done automatically for you is sometimes you don't want your widget to look like a widget. This creates whatever HTML your theme has said widget should be wrapped in. So if the theme says all widgets should be a div and the title should be in an H3, and that's what a widgets are, when you echo this out, that's exactly what comes out. And the theme can change that. But let's say you're making a widget that should have no title. Well, you shouldn't echo out before title and after title with nothing in it. Or maybe it was creating something big there that you now want to not appear. Or what if you're making a widget that does nothing but put a big graphic in place, like it's an advertising thing. And you don't want it to be wrapped in whatever the theme's widget look is. You just want a graphic to appear. Or I've even seen widgets. Like I saw a Google Analytics widget that all it did was echo out the JavaScript for putting Google Analytics on the page so that you could drag, you could put the widget on the page to now put Google Analytics on that page, but not on all pages, only on that page with that widget. You're not saying that's a good idea. But if you were doing something like that, you wouldn't want this blank widget box to suddenly appear just because you tried to inject some JavaScript. So that's why it's that way. So when you put this together, you end up with something that looks like this. Um, and it now works, theoretically. And through the magic of pre-written code, baked earlier today for your pleasure. Oh, look, I actually had an example of the anti-mail, too. We'll skip by that right now. I forgot I had that. Here we go. 
All right, so this is the same code that was up there before. I'm going to save that, change over here. I'm going to actually head over to my widgets area of the dashboard and continue talking while it spins for a second. There we go. Um, and actually, it's already appeared on here a couple times because I had done this before. So look, now if I look over here, here's suddenly this Eli widget, a text widget built for this session. I can drag it over here, put it at the top of my sidebar. You'll notice you'll say there are no options for this widget. I can close that off, and it is now there. So if I go and visit my site, it's now appeared. So we created a widget, and we dropped it in the sidebar. All right. And I realize I'm running low on time here. So. so the next step is to actually make it configurable. Typically, you don't want a widget that just has some text you drop out. However, I've made some of those because sometimes it's useful to, like for an advertising, you know, oh, I want to add spot. I just want to drop here. And we're all programmers, so I'll just edit the widget output by hand if I want to change the graphic. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Really, really. Um, so to do this, we have to implement those two other methods. All right? We have to implement form and update. So I won't go into huge detail on this because, again, it, go to the WordPress site and read through the stuff on this, and you'll go into a lot more detail of what you can do. But basically, the idea is that for creating the form, you're simply outputting the section of the form that you want, of the input elements you want. You don't actually make the form tags. WordPress takes care of that for you on the widget page. So you're just creating the input elements you want. And there's a couple things you need to do to make this happen. Basically, you want to come up with whatever you want the name of your input thing to be. So in this case, we're going to make a title. Okay? So we're calling it title. You'll see title here everywhere. There's a couple functions you have to call to find out from WordPress. I'm going to call this title. WordPress, what are you wanting it called uh, on the form? What should the form element name be? What should the form ID be so that WordPress understands that when the submit happens? So you do that by calling this get field ID and this get field name and passing in title. So then all that we're echoing out here is a paragraph tag just because that's usually what they do and it makes it format nicely. We're going to be nice and make a label, call the label title. Then we're creating the input and ID equals the return value we got from get field ID. Name equals the return value we got from get field name. And it's a text field. And we're also going ahead, and this instance variable gets past whatever the current values are. So we can look at, in this instance variable, look at the instance title. Did it exist? If so, use it. If not, we're going to set a default title of example widget. So from the beginning, there's something in that input. All right. And we're going to go ahead and then echo that back out so that you get to see whatever the current value is. Then the one last thing you need to do is implement the update function. Update, you can officially almost do nothing here. You do have to do something. Um, but update allows you to do sanitization and validation to see, OK, they entered this data, but did I really want that data? And or do I need to clean up that data? So you have two things that are passed into you. There are two arrays, new and old. Sometimes there people name them instant something else. But I like new and old because that I don't get confused. All right? New is an array of everything people just typed in. Old is an array of what all the old values were so that you can compare and contrast. So if, for example, someone you had a please enter a new password for some API you're going to use, and that you, knew, you know that that password is incorrect, either because, oh, it's too short or it's too long, or inside of here, you actually try to contact the API using that password, and it didn't work. You can actually just go, oh, I'm going to keep whatever the old value was. I'm not going to blow that away yet, and just keep the old value. All right. So all you have to do here to make this work is return new, and it works. But you're doing no sanitization. You're doing no checking. And if random data gets posted into you somehow, you're going to accept it all and save it all into the database. So don't do that. Um, what I like doing is just creating a brand new array, which I'm now calling instance, to again not get confused between new and old, because this is the instance I am creating. And then I create specifically the values I know I wanted. I know that I'm only looking for title. 
So I'm going to create a tile, title. I'm going to see if it actually existed or not and make sure it exists. And then I'm going to strip tags and trim on it to just try to keep a nice clean title here. All right. And then you simply return the array. I apologize for rushing through this here right at the end. But, and now you can use this. So now, when inside the widget function, ooh, inside the widget function, that instance array is passed in. And so now we can access instance title. And then the whole thing looks like that. But let me actually show you in here. So let me magically comment that one out. Here's another version. So this one does all that. So in here, we're using the instance title. We now have our form that's being output. And we now have our update that takes care of doing the strip and trim tags for us. We're going to save that. And we're going to go back here. And we're going to head again into the widgets. And we're going to do a little dance while my machine is stupid. And now if we go over here and click on this, we now have an input element. We create one called title. It says example widget in it. I can go in here and say title should be Eli's class. I'm going to save that. It now saved. And if I head over to the local site now, it now says Eli's class instead. I also want to point out real quick, you'll notice that that title actually appeared right here in the UI as well. I don't think I've actually seen this documented anywhere in WordPress. <laughs> However, there's this interesting thing that if you actually create a field named title, WordPress will take the content of it and put it up in the actual title inside the MN UI as well, which is kind of useful given that you can put a widget multiple times. And so you can actually create a title field and never use it in the display, but just use it for admin purposes so that you could actually make it easier to see, oh, this is, a this is an advertising widget that's going to have lots of different types of ads in it. And I just want to have an internal title so I can see which one I'm deleting. So I don't delete the ad someone just paid an extra million on. You know. I wish that was the case. <sighs> All right. So actually, uh, I'm just, just going to make it. So what didn't we cover? Lots of stuff. Like I said, I really wish I had a lot of trouble making this course because there was so much stuff I wanted to do. Like I, I had to leave so much out. I had a whole bunch of slides on how to do Ajax and WordPress because it just impressed me once I saw it, how simple WordPress made it as an integral part. So it makes it very easy, for example, to make a widget or even a short code that because you're going to make a short code that's now a, puts a contact us form in the middle of any post. And it handles all of that because the output of the short code hooks up a couple AJAX endpoints so that this form that the short code generates just sends it off via AJAX and takes care of everything. Um, it makes it very easy to handle that. And you can put that on any page you want, and it doesn't matter. It's not like you have some hard-coded endpoint. It's all coming through this. Um, and again, talking about making custom endpoints in your own MVC by capturing on the init what the URL was and tell WordPress to take a whole different execution route. Uh, WordPress has actually really great c surf protection built in, a whole token system that takes care of that for you. Uh, tons of localization and internationalization stuff that you will have to read up on. Because if you ever look at any existing WordPress code, you're going to go, what the heck is with all these underscore L this that underscore E3 so there's all of these functions out there that take care of internationalization and all the themes and plugins that are shared publicly use them heavily. If you're writing something internally, you don't need to at all because it's internally. However, if you are, it's all in there. There's all sorts of other types of plugins out there. Um, you can make plugins that simply provide code libraries. Like I've seen a plugin that basically had Zim Framework inside of it, and that's all it did. That's all it did was heads and frames inside of it. So then other plugins, this is all for an internal site. So this one plugin just provided Zim framework inside of the code base so that other plugins could then call up knowing the name of that plugin could include those libraries. 
Um, there are drop-in code points and drop-in pages where there are special files. If you name a file a certain thing, WordPress now accepts that and uses it. And that's how, for example, you override the database driver. You create a file with, that, yeah, just DB in that one. Yeah. And there's a, there's a couple others like that. Um, you can modify the admin pages all you want, create all sorts of admin page stuff and fancy different stuff. And again, there's all the post types, and then there's the entire template system, and then the entire WP query and the loop. That's just a ton of different stuff. Um, there's just so much more. Um, so I'm officially out of time, so a brief commercial interruption. Um, first of all, really, if you really want to know more about WordPress, please go read the codex. There's so much good information in there. If you're not up for reading, I will point out that we at PHP Architect offer a uh, training course. Uh, this content was actually based off of that course. That course is a 10 hour long course. I had to somehow slice only an hour out of it and it was really tough. Um, this might be actually like maybe an hour and a half worth of that content really compressed. Um, but we go into a lot more detail about that and go into all the template system and everything else if you're interested. Um, also, if you don't know, we are back in print after being out of print and digital only for a long time. Please come up and fondle them. Really, I'm not kidding. You have to touch these things. When we first got one printed, we went, Ooh. And like I said, I do actually have a couple of these up here if someone would like to have one and take it home. And my slides are, again, up there. And please do rate me on Joined In. And any questions? I will be around, I'd say, all week, but no, the rest of the evening. Uh, if you have anything, want to come see me, or if you want to pet the one orange elephant that exists at the moment. He's not the right color orange. He should be actually this, but he was a spare fabric prototype, so. So thank you very much. <laughs>